shenanigans. Let's start out with Lizzie today. This was one of the hottest topics of the week. Naomi Osaka quit the tournament. Tell us what happened, Lizzie. So uh, last week on May 26, um, Naomi Osaka, who is the current number two women's player, tennis player in the world, she won her first match in at the French Open, which is played on a, a play surface. But before the tournament even began, on May 26, she announced on her social media channels that she would not be doing press conferences at the French Open. Now, for those of you who don't know, for most athletes, professional athletes in at least America, I'm not sure necessarily what the rules are internationally, um, except for tennis, but in America and for tennis, it is required at these tournaments that you make yourself available to the press after your match, whether you win or lose. This is something that you sign in your contract. This is something that every athlete is aware of. And it is noted in your contract that if you do not show up for the press conference, that you will be fined. So Naomi decided that she did not want to participate um, in the press conference portion of the French Open if she won or lost her matches. And again, she won her first match and that she would be willing to accept the fines, saying that she was citing um, mental anguish, mental distress, um, depression from her interactions with the media and the types of questions that they have been asking her since the 2000, I believe, 2018 um, U.S. Open. So my question to, actually, I think it was 2016. My my numbers are a little off. So my question to the panel is, first and foremost, because like Neo said, this has been a hot topic over the past week and a half. I've had to talk about it a lot. I've had to explain about it, explain a lot about it to um, friends, family, people online, because I am a sports journalist. I was the tennis editor at Sports Illustrated, so I know firsthand both sides of the argument with this. But I'm curious, just for the panel, just in hearing that she dropped out of the tournament because um, she didn't want to do the press conference. Well, what, first she announced that she was not going to do the press conferences. Then the French Open, along with the three other Grand Slams, the Australian Open, Wimbledon, which is in two weeks, and the U.S. Open, sided with the French Open and said not only would she be subject to fines, but she could face a default for any match if she decided that she would not participate in the press conferences. So my question to the panel is, as a result of Naomi um, withdrawing once she got from the tournament, from the French Open, once she got that announcement um, from the French Open, what are your impressions? What do you think about this controversy? Let's start with Robbie. I applaud her for stepping away from the tournament and prioritizing her mental health. Um, I believe that her trainers, moving forward, need to help develop her game um, on the court. And they also need to recognize that she has these social anxieties and these pressures uh, that are part of her reality. Um, Like you said, Liz, they they are contractually obligated, and that's in several sports, uh, like in most of the sports that I can think of. If you're not doing the press conference after the fact, you're getting dinged. If you're going to sit there and be stone-faced and quiet, you're getting dinged. Um, If you're not able to fill all of your work duties, then you're unfit for work. So again, I applaud her for walking away. Uh, The interviews are part of the interview. It helps with the endorsements, public relations, all of the the media presentation. And if she can't fulfill the conditions of competition at that level, then she needs to maybe consider stepping back and playing at a level where they don't have those requirements of her. Um, But I'm glad that she's addressing it and she's making it public. I also agree with the venues and the media outlets for standing firm as far as what they have to offer as a product. Unfortunately, entertainers, uh, sports figures end up being commodities more than people. And that's something that you have to know when you enter that world. Interesting. That's why you get paid. That's why you get paid. That's why you get paid. Yeah. Osaka is the highest paid female athlete in the world at this point. Last year in 2020, even during the pandemic, she made 50 over 55 million dollars from she won the US Open um, back in September. She won the Australian Open this year. 
And so money, not just from those two tournaments, but also from endorsements. So there's a lot that goes on in her requirements. Patrick, what do you have to say? I'm going to take a little bit of a different take on this because um, because the first question that comes to my mind is what 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 does is she paid because she's a good tennis player and one of the top tennis players in the world or is she played because she's uh, because she's going on on TV and 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 doing press conferences and 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 shouldn't somebody be able to if they're a really really top of the top of the top tier tennis player uh, and 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 but she has you know it seems to be a disability, mental, mental health issue that prevents her from, from social anxiety, you know, the mental health issue uh, that prevents her from going on, on TV and doing these interviews and dealing with the stress of that. So, so why, what is that? I, I understand, you know, they, they have to make money, of course, but, but why should she have to, I mean, she's made, they're make, she's people, she's making money because people watch Wimbledon and people watch her play. Uh, uh, what what does going on TV and answering questions from reporters have to do with being a, a yeah a top tennis player? And so again, as a member of the media, my my answer to that is first and foremost, most of the press conferences that are done for all of these sports aren't broadcast on television. The purpose of the press conference, yeah, you get snippets for, you know, highlights for ESPN, for local news, um, to hype the tournament, promote the tournament or whatever. But the main purpose of the press conference is so that a media person, a journalist like myself, can do our work. So we can ask these athletes questions so we can write stories. Um, and in, a, in addition to hyping up the tournament or the event. Mm -hmm. And so I, I get what your point is on one side, but on the flip side, the, the average press conference for all of these sports is not broadcast. It's so but people to, can get there and do their work. But to, and they to can, Patrick's they point, can, if someone wants to compete, why can't they just compete? I think that's what he's asking. Why can't yeah. they just, just compete? Okay, if you want to compete though, then don't compete in my tournament because mm -hmm. these are the rules of my tournament and they have been explained to you before you step foot on my tournament soil. On I guess, why are, those, why are those the rules though? I mean, why, why does somebody have to answer questions because of the press? Without the media outlets in a press conference to format. share the I mean, without the media outlet outlets to share the content, to share these stories with us, then we're not tuning in to watch it. We don't know what's going on. We always crave those stories. We want to have our heroes to be humanized. We crave it, and it, they are. It's a brand thing. Um, as a musician, I can't record something and then say, well, I don't want to hear any, any of the criticism. I, I don't want to hear any of the criticism. I can't hide from that because it's part and parcel of it. If you are going to be competing at that level of competition, if you miss a half step, if you wear the wrong thing, people are going to be all over you and you have to accept that as part of competing at that and level. And she'll get that criticism that regardless. Person. Regardless, yeah. I mean, she'll get that criticism regardless. And and that's, I don't think this is a matter of her not wanting to be exposed to criticism. I think it's, from what I read, she she doesn't, she doesn't like being in that sort of quick fire atmosphere where, where people are throwing questions at her. And I, that, you know, that I can kind of understand. Now, uh, there's got to, maybe, maybe there's, I wonder if there's a different, is there a different way to do it? Can, can they give her questions in writing uh, and have her respond to those questions in writing. I mean, is, is it, is it, is it, they have to, I mean, and why not? Considering I mean, the situation, I mean, that she's in, I, you know, I don't necessarily agree with Patrick, but I hear what he's saying. <laughs> um, you know, it's worth considering alternatives, given the situation that she is, especially if you are dealing with someone who has um, a, a mental disorder, or not a mental disorder, but some type of disorder, such as depression or something like that. Maybe you do take that into account and find a way to resolve that situation because it is becoming relatively common, which again, mm -hmm. leads further into my point, but I'll get to my point once we kind of talk this through. And so I'll give you that because truth be told, so when I worked for Sports Illustrated, not only did I cover you know, tennis, but my first two beats were college football and, and the NBA. And I covered the NBA more fervently than I covered college football. So I was at games at least two or three times a week in the locker room. I can guarantee you, the reporters don't wanna be there either. 
This isn't something, this isn't a setup that is put together necessarily by the media. It's the leagues also that put these things together. And so even though, yes, I was a young female reporter, young woman, I think I was, what, 23 when I first started doing locker room duty. Of course, it was very intimidating to me. I did not want to be there. I had some incidents, you know, between myself and other um, male journalists, but also between myself and a other athletes that I had to report to the league because they were inappropriate. You know, I had a jock strap thrown at me. I had, you know, um, things said to me that I, I will not repeat here. But we didn't want to be there either. But that's what that was what we were given. And so I couldn't go back to Sports Illustrated and say, I'm not going to do locker room duty. I don't want this because I knew that going in and I knew that that was the expectation for me. But my question is, because I understand what you're saying, Patrick, and I do think that there needs to be uh, maybe a conversation about how we can change this, about how we can make the rules for media and press conferences more athlete friendly. However, when did Naomi or her people, because I'm going to put this more on her people than mm -hmm. I am on her. Okay. But when did her people give the French Open the opportunity to respond to this? Again, she never wrote them a letter. They never called the officials at the, at the French Open. She released this statement on social media. Last time I checked, when you were in a business contract with a company, when you were making, you know, potentially making millions of dollars with a company for a contract that you have, you have a conversation. You don't announce it on social put media. You talk to the people, the business people that are involved in this contract. And like Rob said, she has PR people. She has a medical team, a medical staff. How is it that she showed up in Paris? And not even just in Paris, because she played... If I'm not mistaken, she played in the Parma tournament in Italy the week before the French Open started, lost in the first round, and she played in the Italian Open in Rome the week before that, lost in the first round. So her confidence, no lie, her confidence was definitely down. But if you're a part of her team and you know this, and you know she's having these issues, why do you have her there? That's, that's probably why, the point I'm, I'm trying, I was going to make yeah, that. I just want to make, I want to read, Dar before I get to what I was going to say, so Daria Winter, I think, is agreeing with Patrick, or in Patrick's corner, so she says, why is she paid? Why do we expect athletes not to be affected by the pandemic? She has done press conferences prior to the pandemic. Um, why is this unrelated? The questions are not, hold on, the questions are not related to the media questions by and large, question mark. Why are these challenges not taken seriously about behavior post-pandemic? that allow for modification. Sometimes the medical condition produces unexpected behaviors. But how is the tournament supposed to know about her needs medically if she doesn't make them aware of that? Like she never said well, anything she, about before. She did. She, she did. I thought she said something. Um, sorry. I thought she said something at, at the beginning of this that she she the reason why she couldn't participate in the in the and uh, the in the press conferences was that she said she had some sort of social anxiety. I mean, it wasn't just she communicated that to the to the French Open folks, didn't she? She communicated that in her statement, her social media statement. There was never a conversation between her people and, and the French, French Open. Open. They, they even mm -hmm. acknowledged after the fact that when they first found out about it, um, that she was pulling out. Not necessarily that she didn't like to do press conferences, because I don't think many athletes like to do press conferences. But when they found out that she had said that she was going to pull out of the press conferences, that they reached out to her. They reached out to her PR team. And again, I'm putting this on her PR people, her agent, her manager, whatever. They reached out to them and was met with radio silence. And so then that's when they released the statement saying, okay, not only are you going to be fined, but you could potentially be defaulted for if you show up to the next match and you happen to win, we're going to default you. Yeah. Um, so she mm. never gave her the opportunity to sit down and work with her and figure out what's going on. And let me just say, before you get back into it, Neo, let me just say, she's not the only player on the tour that has talked about their mental health the issues. Person, uh -huh. The current number one player in women's tennis, Ash Barty, she took 18 months off of the tour 
to deal with her depression and anxiety. The number two player, Davi Medvedev, he travels with the sports psychologist. He talked about in the past week because up until this week, he's been shitty on clay. He's been winning. He just won today, so he's doing fairly well. But up until this week, he had a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. He travels with his sports psychologist. There are several tennis athletes because it's an individual sport. All you have is you and your coach and your trainer. So a lot of these players travel with sports psychologists. So again, my question is to Naomi's people, why didn't you take care of her before it got to this fever pitch? So I agree with what I agree with. Um, I, I'm kind of I got to admit, I, I'm kind of in Lizzie and Robbie's corner on this one. Um, and they have differing points of view, too. But I'm I'm wondering, like, uh, part of my concern is that I feel like we're over labeling um, mental anxiety and disorders because I, I feel like as someone who has been depressed at times, been sad, been um, dealt with confidence issues. Um, so a lot of it's normal. I feel like it's normal. This is normal. Um, you know, it's normal to have, be anxious. I'm anxious all the time. I'm anxious half the time when we start this show. I mean, these are normal <laughs> human emotions, you know, and we all deal with it. And I feel like sometimes I feel like we, and I'm wondering how you guys feel. I feel like we're over labeling. I think we're, you know, and another thing, when we look at elite players, one of the things I've always admired about elite players is, you know, where I lack confidence sometimes and I don't do well at sports or some things because sometimes I'm just having a bad day or I'm feeling down. The elite players, I kind of admire the fact that they're able to overcome those lack of confidence issues or those, mm -hmm. you know, they go out there and every game they're whoosh, shooting shoot shots or hitting the balls like crazy. And they're like, and that was what makes them elite because they're able to overcome what's normal to us. The anxiousness, the lack of confidence, the depression. I, I was depressed but on my Neil, birthday. <laughs> I mean, I, mean that was I, think there's, well, I, I think there's differences between your garden level anxiety sure, sure. that we all feel and there's, and there's social anxiety that rises to a level that, that can be very crippling. And there's depression that can rise to a level that can be very crippling. Absolutely. We don't know no, with Naomi and I, I want to before, before but, I just want to reiterate. I just want to say I definitely understand that there are spe spectrums. So there are different people. People are yeah. depressed, clinically depressed, and things like that. I'm not discounting that, but I think some mm -hmm. of what we're dealing with here is normal. Well, go ahead. Yeah, just, because oh, when they're know. talking about her social anxieties, let me, let me and let stuff Patrick say what he was going to say. I'm sorry, I cut him off. Let me just let him get in. Sorry. I, I, I mean, I, I just don't think we know that. I, 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 I think she said she can't do it because of, of social anxiety. We, I think to some extent we have to give, unless we know her medical, you know, diagnosis or medical history, we have to give her a little bit the benefit of the doubt to say that, that, that it, it does prevent her from, from being in this, at, this atmosphere. Yeah. And Robert, that's certain, no, no, because no, what no, it was I'm saying not, in the I'm articles not. is that the big thing that she was having uh, issues with is the sports journalists were questioning her ability to play on a clay surface because she's had weaker results there. And as a result of being questioned on it, it instilled doubt in her. Well, that's part of the game. It, if you, it's, a, it's a team sport, your own teammates are gonna chirp on you. But because this is an individual sport, you don't have those supports. So if you're making $50 million a year, travel with a psychologist who's going to help you perform at that level and stay healthy because, I mean, Look or, at individual or not sports. do it if, you, if you're not Look healthy. Look at t Tiger's not, not a mentally healthy person. He would really benefit from having a sports psychologist. With, he would have benefited from that rather than have his dad. And listen, I'm not saying I don't believe any of what Naomi is feeling or what she has gone yeah. through, anything about her anxiety or her depression. Because she's what mentioned, saying, this isn't the first time she's mentioned it. She's, she's talked about it. What yeah. I'm saying is, is that her team Yes, There's and I agree with the team. This. They failed her. And I think I think Fred Hargrove asked, you know, why do we think that she made the the announcement on social media versus, you know, meeting with the French Open? I think that's what young people do these days. You know, they flex on social media versus sitting down and having a conversation. And that when you're dealing with a business, because remember, sports is a business. It's an entertainment business. When you're dealing with the business and you're dealing with millions, billions of dollars, 
You can't just, you know, make your claims, you know, talk to your social media audience and think that that's okay. Like you have to, just like you sat down and had that, you know, um, worked out the parameters of your contract and how much you're going to get paid. You have to do that when something is wrong. And if she needs help, and I, I do think that she does, at least some assistance, at least some guidance into how to deal with this, because tennis is a very lonely sport. It's a very lonely sport, but no one can help you if you don't make that known to people. Like you have to let us help, help us help you. And so that's why, and uh, again, a little bit, you know, I, I'm a journalist and so kind of take offense a little bit, but more importantly, I want, I don't want Naomi to come out of this feeling like the villain here. Yeah. I think she has yeah. adults around her who could have handled this better for her and they didn't. Now she's got, well, she's an adult support. though. We, we don't want to act like she's not an adult. But she's not but she's an adult. She's an adult who, who's, but she's an adult who's used to just dealing with playing tennis. That's why she hires an agent. That's why she has a manager. That's why she has a training staff. So I'm looking at the I comments want, on. Okay. I was just gonna say I want her to pay attention to the fact that this wasn't just the French Open. Like the the all four Grand Slams locked down and was like, we're not having that. Like you at least have to have a conversation with us. Yeah. You at least have to talk to us and let us what's go, let us know what's going on. So I, it, it does sound like um, most of our our audience is in agreement with Patrick. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, um, so Olivia points out depression and sadness is different. It is, I, and I'm not saying it's not. So I'm not trying to differentiate that. I'm just saying I think a lot of what we're dealing with is a lot of what we see is a little more normal than. We are treating it right now, uh, but anyway. Exactly. Uh, and and so Daria just asked if we know what clinical depression is. Well, I definitely know. Yeah, clinical um, depression had, is clinical. Yeah, that's an, that's a definite disorder. Um, but the the point is, no one is going to know if you are clinically depressed if you don't if you don't advocate for yourself or your team. Like you have a team. Like, I would honestly, I would fire if I were Naomi Osaka right now, I would fire my entire team, my PR team, my medical team, because they did not treat her and handle this in a way that was to her advantage. And so yeah. now we don't know. She played. Um, so the French Open ends this Sunday. Right after the French Open, the grass court season starts. So grass court tournaments start. She pulled out of the, the subsequent grass court tournament. Um, before Wimbledon, that was supposed to be, that is in Germany. So she's not going to play in that tournament. I mean, you know, the British press is brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. Uh, Way worse than the French press. And so it begs the question, is she, are they going to have her mentally ready to get to Wimbledon? Okay. Because that's well, we're gonna their have job. To, we're going to have to move on from this one. Let me just get a couple more comments in. Uh, Fred, Fred Hargrove says, I agree with Lizzie about the team. Curious for uh, I'm curious about if her team advised her on the post. Uh, Ephraim says, I agree. She let people know how she feels. Just don't say or so they can read her mind. Um, and there, okay, so Jacqueline Robson points out, there's a difference between normal situational anxiety and depression and clinical diagnosed anxiety disorders. Yes. Yes, absolutely agree and know that. Um, but again, I do still feel like we are normalizing. So we are, we are labeling some of these things as clinically depressed or depression when it is just simply normal that we, uh, I just feel like, if, I just feel like just, confidence and even, things like that. That's even normal. if it's just confidence or something that involves anxiety, you that's see, and it's not me. clinical depression, but that's to you, Neo, you're not out in mm. front of on center court playing tennis. Sure. And so, if if a young tennis player, a young athlete, a young basketball, football, player, if they need something, someone to get them just through that, <laughs> it's not typical depression, but just that anxiety, hire someone to help them. That's yeah. your job. As a and they do have the yeah. funds to do that. And they need hire to someone to yeah. Where I didn't, but I could I, I'd probably I, be a star basketball player if I could figure out, could have figured out my confidence issues. So I, 
<laughs> I will say, I, I do think that there, there needs to be a back and forth here and they, they should come up with a solution. Uh, that's how, and I, I represented people with disabilities, particularly people with mental illness for many years in, in, in the DC mental health system. And that's how, when you, when you need an accommodation for something like anxiety, you, you make a request for it, you, you sit down and you work something out. And that's probably what should be happening here. That's yes. probably not. And I think there should be some consideration for it. I mean, I'm going back to what Patrick said. I do do think there should be some consideration for mental health of athletes with these tournaments and and, and big business. Um, but we got to move on. So let's let's go ahead and move on. All right. Truth, lies, shenanigans.